Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's devoted to mechanics everywhere to help them live happier, healthier, more productive lives. I am your host, Joshua Taylor, founder of Wrench Turners Online. And today we have another episode in the recruitment series. We have an individual that's been around the block a few times, been in recruitment for over 30 years, working for the top three automotive groups here in Canada. So much so that I want to say, I think we discussed it earlier, it's about 10 years ago, tried to recruit me for a technician position, position, but we'll probably get into that a little later. Ladies and gentlemen, Patty Ruggia. Patty, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. But you're aging me much worse. It's more like uh, 12 years. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, you're lucky I'm not hanging up on you, Joshua. <laughs> well, I, one thing I do know is that um, you don't look like you've been in the industry for well, over 30 years. <laughs> I appreciate right? that. Well, how about, we, how about we say that before I get keel hauled over here within the first five minutes? So, Patty, you are not a mechanic and you've never been a mechanic and you've not worked in service. However, you've spent a lifetime, as it were, in automotive helping technicians uh, get into the business or move throughout the business within automotive groups. You're a little bit different when it comes to recruitment because you've worked specifically for automotive groups recruiting into those automotive groups versus an independent uh, or third party recruitment agency like some of the other uh, recruiters we've had on the show thus far as part of the series who are just recruiting as an entity getting people into and or through automotive. So it's a little bit Correct. different. I'm really looking forward yeah. to this, uh, to sh having this perspective shared because it's really going to be. It might not be drastically different, but it's definitely going to be different in, in your in your career thus far. But what I want to do is give us our our, our control, as it were, because on the show, we have the same basic four uh, questions that we ask everybody to kind of see how things are different. And while all at the same time, how things are the same through everybody in automotive. So what is the thing that really got you into automotive in the first place? Well, at the end of the day, a recruiter is nothing without the relationships that they build. And it was through a relationship from somebody that I had worked with uh, at a hospitality company a thousand years ago. Um, I had worked with this person for a good five to seven years. Uh, we became quite close personally and as well professionally. And then I did what a lot of uh, people do. You move on and have a life and have a family. And then out of the blue one day, um, this, uh, this person called me and said, are you you interested in working full time yet? Are you able to come back to a full time capacity? And I saw, and I was considering looking for something full time. And again, I come from hospitality, human resources. And she said, "Well, I'm working for a large dealer group in the Vaughn area, and I'm looking for an, an a recruiter, HR assistant, while my uh, assistant's gone on mat leave." So I can only speak to for me, it was about relationships, is how I kind of got into automotive retail and worked for a large group um, right up until September of 2020 and then worked for another large group. And now I work for the group that I'm with. And again, it's all about relationships. I'm still working with and in, in, in and with the same person. Awesome. That's, that's amazing. Those long-term relationships, you mm -hmm. know, we, there's a lot of folks who talk about, and I say that as in bold caps talk about how important long-term planning for everything is. You know, setting long-term goals, setting long-term plans, um, building long-term relationships and how invaluable they can be. When it comes to automotive, I think because a lot of the things that we do, whether it's whether it's sales or service, I think it's even more so in sales than it is anywhere, where the, the thinking is on a 30-day cycle. It's a very 30-day cycle. So, but somehow at the same time, we get measured on not only 30 days, but 30 days, a week, three months, you know, your quarters, your years, year over year, like it, it becomes a, a constant revolving door of measurements of what you're being measured against. But at the end of the day, when we look at success, we don't look at 30 days or That's three right. months or a year. We're looking at a decade, two decades, yes. three decades or more. What is, what is it that we're doing for the businesses, business or businesses over that long period of time? Now, with that said, you've cultivated those relationships for a long time. If you can, you can go back to that first full year of full time. What was sure. that first year in recruitment full time like? Well, I was doing recruiting as well as some HR administrative. Um, and then I was kept on after I had been there 
you know, covering this mat leave as a recruiter. So I had my my paws in a whole bunch of different plates. Um, so it was fast paced. Um, I had never worked in automotive retail before, but again, the skills of hospitality were transferable. You're still serving and dealing with people, even if it's on an internal basis. My customers, of course, would have been service managers and sales managers um, and general managers and everything in between um, that help a, a dealership to function. So it was uh, very chaotic and fast paced. It uh, wasn't what I was used to, but uh, I learned to to hit the ground running, so to speak. And sometimes we spin our wheels. There's a car pun for you, Joshua. Sometimes we spin our wheels, but here I am um, 12 years later. And uh, I don't think, I don't know if I could work in a different industry and not be bored um, because um, automotive retail, you know, whether it's sales and service, I do have a, a focus on service uh, with some of my college connections. So it's, you hit the ground running and just, I haven't looked back. I guess that's a good way to put it because I've stayed in automotive retail since 2012. Awesome. So what would you say, what would you say is the thing that in that first year or a couple of years, you mentioned it's a big, bit chaotic and hitting the ground running. <laughs> I think there's a lot of folks that that probably think similarly where it's where it's a challenge in that regard. I think you know top level stores there's going to be there's going to be a, an ounce of cha chaotic or chaos to it. Mm -hmm. But I think the top tier folks, the the leaders, are capable of of smoothing that chaos out there's always going to be chaos involved because you're literally dealing dealing with the public right That's a store right. is dealing with the public so you can't and you can you can attempt at planning you can attempt at at preparing for what you think is going to happen but you know as soon as the day comes as soon as a customer breaches that door instantaneously that plan is going to have to change in some regard because that 7 30 appointment just turned into a 7 45 drop off that you didn't have a loaner plan for or a shuttle plan for that it was supposed to be a waiter or vice versa. That's right. And when it comes to leadership and I'm assuming from, from a recruitment standpoint, when you're trying to hire into those positions, when you're like, this is automotive is awesome. It's really awesome. Every day is a, a is a really awesome challenge and really trying to, to, to cultivate those relationships with those people. That's right. Um, that may have never worked with automotive before. Would you say, would you say in your time recruiting that you exclusively hired, you know, helped transition people from automotive into automotive, or would you say you hired significantly from outside into automotive? Well, that's a great question. So you have two of those factors. So naturally, if we're if we were adv advertising for a sales consultant, I may be looking for somebody that has previous automotive sales experience. It really depends on the the needs of the team. But let's talk mm -hmm. about service because we're we're here on Reg Turner. So let's take an apprenticeship and a or a service department. So let's say. Um, a, a local dealership is looking for an apprentice. Well, that the, the level of apprentice will depend currently on the current operating needs of the current team. If a service manager has four really strong technicians and three apprentices ready to write in the next six to eight months, he or she may be able to accommodate a newbie that maybe just has entry level or shop experience or graduated from a local motive power program that doesn't have, that has little or no shop experience. They may be able to accommodate that. But in terms of if it's a shop that says, hey, I'm not sure that I can accommodate a newbie right now. I need a level three because I don't have any, you know, I've, I don't have enough people. It's really comes down to based on the strength of the current operating team in the shop as to how we're focused on our recruiting. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to build relationships with apprentices and technicians um, that may not be a fit right now in terms of the needs of the team, but I'm definitely going to be recruiting and looking for to serve the current operating team's needs. Like, And, and that's one of the things that's good about uh, having an internal recruiter with an automotive dealer group because I literally have their best interest at heart. Whereas an external recruiter, not to, to shoot anybody down, but they're looking to fill that role with whoever or wherever. I'm specifically focused on, in my in my case right now, I have 29 dealerships in Ontario. I'm gonna be, be, be heartfelt making sure that I'm taking care of the dealer group that I work for and making sure that I get the right candidates in that place, depending on the needs of the operating team. I hope that sounds fleshed out okay. Yeah, it does. And I think one of the things that 
that may, you know, maybe the important thing to take away from that from technicians that are listening is that when you're dealing with a recruiter, and this is something that's kind of coming out in the series, it's it's kind of Oops. interesting. Not one necessarily worse. I think as my dad would say, it just because it's different doesn't make it wrong. That's but right. What I understand from a recruitment standpoint, different con when you're looking at third party recruitment at this stage and what I'm now learning is that you have kind of two two steps that most re recruitment agencies are kind of compensated on. Okay. You've got and it well th maybe three. You've got initial placement, right? You've got some kind of initial placement. You get somebody, you know, you've you've done your your due diligence on this individual as a recruiter. You've done as much due diligence on the person and as much due diligence on on the company that you're placing for as much as you can and you place this person. Awesome. That's step one. Step two is they got to get through 90 days. If they, they got to get through 90 days in order for the recruitment AG agency to kind of finalize getting paid to some degree um, in, in some circumstances, some are a lot less, some are more. And I would suggest that in some circumstances when the position is large, where perhaps the the incomes and, and I think some of the agencies, as, as I understand it, some of them take a flat fee. Some of them take a percentage of whatever placement value uh, a yearly income is, whatever the case may exactly. be. Exactly. When you're placing a, an executive general manager, the, the fee and the percentage is going to be sig uh, significant value. That's so correct. The, the hiring store is going to have a lot bigger uh, caveat or kind of line in the sand. They've got to make it a year before you get your full allotment. So they have that those three stages of commitment. Well, even if you have a year commitment to make sure that that person stays a year, that's a year. A Even lot at can that happen. Length, that's a year. A lot can happen in a year. And, and unfortunately, people can leave or not be the right fit or where the case may be. A year is not necessarily a long time, but it's also not a short time. Yeah. Right? In, in all circumstances. But you, as an internal recruiter, you're looking to hire somebody who's going to stay with the company for their career. That, that is, is your goal, hopefully. Goal, right? That's yeah. that's hopefully what you're hiring for. You're not looking just for fit for today. Not that's just correct. look for fit for a year from now. You're looking for fit for forever. That's and correct. That functionally, is what you're the difference between the internal and the external recruitment agency, as yeah. as I see it thus far. Yep, yeah. and 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 as well, you know, again, having having the current operating team's best interest at heart, I'm I'm not working on commission. I am strictly looking to build relationships with candidates who hopefully want to work with us now, today, or tomorrow. And if not, I'll still reach out to you or encourage you to reach out to me in two or three weeks, regardless of which capacity that you're working in, because we know that building those relationships, especially in automotive service, whether it's an entry level apprentice or even a, a, a lot porter who maybe wants to get into becoming an apprentice right up into, uh, you know, a first level, second level, or, you know, gold, silver, or bronze technician, depending on the brand that they work for. So again, mm -hmm. it comes down to those relationships. And again, you know, recruiters, you know, again, external recruiters are successful and have been successful. My experience when um, at, at, a, at one company in specific um, in using them was that when a recruiter found a technician specifically for us, there was it was always a challenge because they would say, oh, look what this company wants to offer me. And then your part of your competition is the current candidate, if he or she is already working, is their current employer. Whereas for the most part, I'm recruiting or talking to people who have applied for ads. I may be doing some Indeed searches, right, depending on um, um, the service that I that I am involved with. And I can reach out to candidates and say, hey, are you interested in a role with us? And it'll be them that responds as opposed to me reaching out to a tech at a different dealer group and saying, hey, I want you to come and work for us, whether I'm an external recruiter or not, because we all know that you get your 310S technician. That's a golden ticket. Joshua, you do, again, you have your 310S? I do, ma'am. You could right now go get a job in Manitoba if you wanted to or NBC if you wanted to, because if you sent off your resume, you know that the, the HR person or the service manager is going to call you. Now, regardless of how what that ends up, that's different. But these 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 ladies and gentlemen are holding a, a golden ticket when they get their 310S. And again, you get your higher level apprentices, depending on the brands that they've been, been exposed to, they're in high demand. So it's almost mm -hmm. their game that we're playing. 
and by their rules. My my challenge right now from my side of the coin is is you know I'm trying to help technicians live happier, healthier, more productive lives. Yes. And the challenge the challenge that I have with it is that in order to be productive, you need to be a team player. And the challenge with some of the folks that have come to me for coaching that I've had the opportunity to have a chat with in some circumstances, lots of chats with and, and through coaching is holding themselves accountable. I think that is the single biggest challenge that I have with technicians across the board they're, that they're either are or are not willing to hold themselves accountable for whatever actions that they are taking across the board. Whether it's behavior, whether it's uh, technical skills, whether it's training, whatever the case may be, is holding themselves accountable. And when we have an opportunity like we have right now where technicians are in high demand and, as you say, have, have the opportunity for the golden ticket, <laughs> it, it's important that we are as respectful as we, we can be, even if it wasn't a golden ticket age. Right. That's right. because the last thing that we need to do is get ourselves in a circumstance where, let's say, five years down the road, all of a sudden you got it's, it's like buyer's remorse on a, on a house that's one hundred thousand dollars over list. Right. The last thing we want to be as mechanics is in 10 years for whatever. Let's hypothetically speaking, I, I know yeah. this is not necessarily going to be the case, but hypothetically speaking, we get ourselves in a position where there's an influx of all of a sudden, you know, Three times more people will go through uh, technical training, and now all of a sudden you have a flood of young, That's eager, right. ambitious technicians. And Wouldn't now it's no longer me? now you <laughs> no longer have a shortage, right? Now That's all of a right. sudden, all of those wages that we were potentially getting, and all of those benefits and bonuses and things that we were getting access to, just falls off. What are we left with? Our integrity and our relationships, right? We have, yeah. that's all we have left is, is our, right. our relationships and our integrity. And if we kibosh that without holding ourselves accountable, it becomes a real challenge. With that's that right. said, what are the, are, would you say that's one of the difficulties you have through kind of, what would you say is your vetting process to try and make sure technicians do in fact can or do what they say they can do? Well, at the, at the end of the day, I'm a recruiter that gets the people in the door. I think of myself as a gatekeeper. So if I come across, a, you know, a, a, a master technician from an Audi dealership locally, I'm like, first of all, if it's a Sunday afternoon and I happen to be looking at the ad, I'm going to probably text that person on Monday morning at 645, because if I don't, six other service managers are going to try to reach out to them. So first of all, I'm going to try to get a hold of them right away. Second of all, I'm going to try to build a little bit of a relationship with them, arrange, arrange a call, see what, find out what they're looking for. Um, as far as integrity, if I book an appointment with them and they don't show, Again, it, it's a 310S technician, so I'm probably going to give him or her another chance. But again, they're already establishing a foundation for which I'm going to deal with you again in the future. If, you know, I have a rule with technicians and apprentices, if you don't show up twice, then I'm probably going to put a note in your file that says no show. Maybe in two to three years, I'll talk to you again if you apply, but you've already kind of left that bad taste in my mouth. But for the most part, let's take a technician who has applied for the job. I've been able to talk to him or her. I've confirmed that obviously the vetting process on my end is do you have a valid driver's license, hopefully a clean, dri clean driver's abstract. Do you have your 310S technician license? Yes or no, I'm about to write or my, 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 my exam is scheduled for June 15th. Those are all things that I want to know before I go to bat for that candidate's resume with a service manager. Some of them are shoe-ins and I'm just going to book them, but it really depends on the needs of the team and the manager at the time, right? So mm -hmm. then I'll book the appointment and I'm telling you more a lot and again since covid we haven't talked about the covid factor yet with people no showing whether they're technicians or sales consultants or apprentices have have just grown astronomically and i could show you i don't have anything yet because i'm still getting my feet wet with my new company but my old email inbox i could just do a search in my calendar of no show and i'd be it's laughable how many no-shows show up because I won't forget that. I'll put that in there. Again, if you're a technician, I'll still probably consider you again, but I'll be proceed with caution because of that person. So to draw it back to the, to the terms of integrity, it's of course how you communicate in the interview and when you show up and you tell the service manager what you can do because a service man, a candidate will fold like a cheap tent with a service manager if they don't know their stuff. 
I don't, I've never worked on a car before, I, although I can, um, I know how to put the uh, windshield white fluid in my car. I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> but a service, a candidate will fold like a cheap tent with a service manager. So it's up to that, up to the service manager or the assistant service manager's job to kind of vet that candidate from that st standpoint. I'm looking at it relationally in vetting. Do you have your 310S license? Do you have your 310, you know, your, your, your G license? And have you shown up for the interview? Have you kept in touch with me? If you can't make the interview, have you called me and said, hey, Patty, I can't make the interview? No problem. That happens. Life happens to everybody, right? So integrity mm -hmm. is 98% of the game, in my opinion. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. The, the challenge that we see, we both see. And unfortunately, you know, I didn't want to believe it when I started Wrench Turners that, you know, we were the problem. You know, with the Taylor Swift song, I'm the problem. <laughs> we are the problem. Unfortunately, for those of you that are watching and listening, and I asked you to be on a recording, and you said yes, and then you no-showed, and then you ghosted, and then you didn't respond. There I'm sorry, go. but considering there's going to be about 30 technicians re released on the show by the end of June this year, and I would say I had 30 booked no-shows with technicians in the last year and a half, it's... It's, I'm not looking for money from you folks. I'm not, I'm not, I, everything is, this is all free. This is all for you to get your voices heard because yeah. everybody needs to hear your stories and your voices, but you should yeah. no show more than anybody. And so that go. word, that word resonates with you. So what's happened. And again, you know, I feel like recruiting in the wild or since COVID has been like, it was, it was challenging before, but recruiting since COVID, it's like the wild, wild west. I don't, I don't even judge resumes as harshly as I used to. I don't, um, I don't, like I said, I will give people a second chance and, and make that accommodation. But when it comes down to, I like that you mentioned integrity at the beginning, we could focus the whole, the whole podcast on the word integrity in it, you know, in the environment. And at the end of the day, you're right. There may come a day when we do have an influx. That's what I'm hoping for. I've got too many 310S technicians to choose from, but until then, you know, building those relationships, maintaining them and nurturing them and just the, the manners that your mom and dad taught you, you know, like let somebody know if you can't make it, like if you're late for work, what would you do? I'm going to text my boss or call my boss. If I'm late for an interview, I'm so sorry. I'm running late, those types of things. But I, again, I, I see when I said the word no show that resonated with you. Big time, big time. Like I would suggest uh, for, for podcast recordings in the last year and a half, going almost two years now, um, we've got 120 total episodes published. Actually, we got probably be knocking on the door 140 here, not too long from now. Wow. And of the people that no showed, I think I can probably count on one hand that aren't mechanics. Everybody else is, um, everybody else. I got maybe, maybe one general manager that no showed ghosted, oh. which I look once I, once I, you know, once it occurred, once those things occurred, you start looking into the people and you do, you know, a little bit of deep diving. It's like, okay, is this, is this normal? Should I, should I be following like three, four five follow ups? Like I would normally like yep. as, as sales goes, usually like 80% of people can be closed by the eighth uh, piece of reach out. Well, yep. that means that you have to get to eight. Well, in this circumstance, do you do that much outreach? Well, when you dig into some of these people online and you understand that, you know, all of a sudden this is a pattern. This is, this is this mm -hmm. individual's, mo as it were and and you go from there that's but right when it comes to technicians it's hard for you folks to show up so if it's hard for you folks yeah. to show up for me for me little old me i can only imagine what you folks are doing for for other people so be mindful that your integrity right. is on display when you no show so that's especially right. the no show no call or the no call no show however you guys yes. phrase it but the no call no show is is hurtful it's disrespectful yeah so I Very understand much things so. happen, but I digress. And I so without going too far down the rabbit hole on that. That's okay. It's okay. Without going too far down the rabbit hole on that, because then it, it just becomes um, somewhat challenging for some folks to listen, but because even though you need to hear it. Um, when, <laughs> as, as time has transpired since about 2012, and you got into it heavily, and you've been with a big group, and you're with another big group, and what would you say outside of shortage 
has been the biggest challenge finding technicians, shop foremen, service managers? Outside of shortage. Well, of course, shortage is, is, is the most. Um, we're also dealing with, um, and again, this is collective over my last 12 years, is temporary mm -hmm. foreign workers. So that's been a challenge, is um, hiring temporary foreign workers um, through the LMIA program. That is a big challenge, uh -huh. um, but it, it really is just shortage. So if you do a posting for a 310S technician, you're like, oh, let's, that's why I said I wasn't joking about a Sunday afternoon. If I happen to be, I'm going to check the ads on a Sunday afternoon so I can send that email off before another recruiter, before another service manager gets them. But um, I'd really say, I'd really say that shortage is what stands um, forward. So I can't really, I, I don't know how to f give you more than that, um, other than the shortage, because it still very much is. Um, the last company that I worked with, we we offered signing bonuses as well. Again, I'm still getting my feet wet with Auto Canada, so I'm not sure of all the intricacies of, uh, of, of what goes on from a recruiting standpoint. I'm still new. But yeah, in my last two roles, it was really just trying to get people interested and trying to apply post and pray, so to speak, as opposed hmm. to being able to reach out to them. Um, you know, and, a, and I'm a big um, no, no, when it comes to poaching, um, I mm -hmm. would never reach out to I would never, um, you know, look at the technicians on somebody's website and then look them up on Instagram and say, hey, I work for so and so do you want to come and work for me? That's what an external recruiter can do because they're being paid to do that. But there's a, there, if I'm if I'm asking my technicians and apprentices to have integrity, I also have to act with integrity as well. So um, the biggest challenge is always going to be that shortage for the time being um, and maybe sometimes getting a service manager to come in on a Sunday or Saturday morning <laughs> because mm -hmm. they've been slamming it out from 730 to 530 every day, Monday to Friday, and just say, hey, this technician is very concerned about his employer. Can you please see him or her on a Saturday morning? So I'm sorry I can't flesh that out better for you, but that's my experience. That's okay. I, I the, it's probably a challenge that everybody in your position is yes. is kind of having and what is was what is the best course of action going forward yes. now um that said when you have well that, that in of itself is a is a challenge we can talk about a little bit you're talking sure. about saturday morning interviews or or <laughs> evening interviews is that yes. something that is commonly required like i know yes. myself i used to take you know, back in the day, I used to take lunch breaks or longer lunch breaks or whatever the case may be to, to go do that because I'm, I'm doing my best to accommodate somebody else's working day as well. Yeah, that's that's one thing from a professional standpoint. Somebody's got a job to do and they have operating hours. And if I that's can right. do what I can do to make sure that they can operate within their own operating hours, I will that's do right. that as best as I possibly can. Now, on the same same token, I'm in the same position right now. I have operating hours that are now loose. So I have the opportunity to do things uh, for myself, for my family, and so on and so forth when I need to. And then yeah. I make sure that the other things are accommodated elsewhere. So yeah. is that something that's that's really come up That's a, that's been a challenge? Um, I, I don't know if it's a challenge. I think it's a new way of being. You know, I'm, um, prior to COVID, I would never have thought of texting a candidate. Post COVID, I email, I call, and I text because for the most, you know, I even have some people say, oh, I don't look at that email. Then why is it on your resume? But that's okay. I'm thinking outside of the box. I'm going to text that candidate. So yeah, and, and I will go to bat for candidates and say, listen, this candidate is being respectful to their current employer and they would prefer an evening appointment. Um, or a Saturday morning is, can that work for you? And most of the time, the service managers or GMs will say, no problem, I can't do it, but the GM will come in or my shop foreman will stay. I'll just, it's about, it's about the recruiter going to the, to, to the bat for the candidate because we want them to be respectful to their current employer because if they're respectful to their current employer, they'll be respectful to us. Now, on the other hand, back to, to our no-show conversation, I've booked appointments on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. and then the person didn't show up. So again, at the end of the day, I will go to bat for candidates because, you know, candidates are my customers. 
So I will, if you ask me out of the blue and say, I can't come in between 7.30 and 5.30, I'll say, when can you come? Or throw a couple of days and times at me. There's a, there, That's time consuming, going back and forth. Let me see what I can do for you. Again, like I'm like a gatekeeper, right? So it's a little bit more than just picking up the phone to call mm -hmm. somebody. Again, they're working. Sometimes the answer were in the shop. And I'll always say to, say to a candidate, is this a good time to talk? I want to be completely respectful to your current employer. And I'd say 80% of the people I talk to, technicians and everybody else alike, appreciate that because they have picked up the phone. They're like, oh, whose number is that? Then if they didn't pick up, I follow up with a text. Let me know when is a, is a good time to talk. And if I'm asking a service manager to stay late at 5.30 or 6 o'clock, who else do you think is answering the phone at 5.30 if a technician calls me mm -hmm. back, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. it can be challenging, but I think... Have to think outside of the box. That puts a lot of strain on you and the service manager, right? We we one of the things <laughs> that again back to accountability and integrity is is if we're looking to improve our own lives for our own families as mechanics and technicians, we need to make sure that we're also respectful of the time of the people that we're we're asking, right? We need to make That's sure right. that as best as that we can provide, we give we give in return. Right. So it's I see that two way street. I see that two way street and it's also a challenge when I hear those stories where you've done everything you possibly can to accommodate us, you know, make it a Saturday morning, make it, make it a reasonable, reasonable is the wrong word, but I will use yeah. the word reasonable time at 10 o'clock in the morning because some of us <laughs> like to sleep in on a Saturday morning. I don't know what sleeping in on a Saturday morning is like. I have a 10 year old. I haven't slept in on a Saturday morning in over a decade. So I digress. But having those mm -hmm. options available and then people still not showing, technicians still not showing, we got to do better, That's folks. That's more infrequent. That's more infrequent. But yeah, still, I just should, had to mention it. Conversation. In, in, in my opinion, it shouldn't even it shouldn't even be something that you should think of as, because it's so rare. It shouldn't yeah. even be brought up in conversation. But it's not, which means that we need to do better as a profession, as an industry, ladies and gentlemen. We represent, you got the 310S, you got the 310G, and it doesn't matter what industry you're working as a mechanic. If Patty is saying that it, she's accommodated us to try and help us out and we're ghosting, folks, that's integrity. We need to do better. We need to do better. On that, on that note, let's, let's tuck into something. You've got some experience now dealing with technicians and, and talking mm -hmm. with technicians and service managers. What would you say throughout the process? What would be your piece of advice for a technician to, to be happier, healthier, more productive? Currently working technician or somebody who's looking for a job? Currently working technician. Um, you know, uh, when your service manager tells you to go online and do your manufacturer's training, get it done as soon as possible. I've heard those types of complaints. Um, uh, be be open. Some some of the technicians they want the gravy um, rather than helping out an apprentice. You know, you can you can you know up your 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 value as a technician, as a contributor to the team, and maybe that next step into a shop foreman's role by taking apprentices under your wing and, and, mm -hmm. and really letting them understand how valuable they can be in, you know, in this industry. And, you know, so yeah, absolutely. So again, somebody who's currently employed is just certainly getting your manufacturer's training done. If there's any type of an extra, like I know um, one of the local colleges, Conestoga has a micro credential um, right now staying, maybe, maybe keeping in keeping abreast of your local college connection. You know, I know Centennial, I know Conestoga, Fanshawe, Mohawk, keep in touch with your professors. You know, you never know what they're going to know. You never know what the school might be offering. Sometimes these are free courses. Sometimes they're not, but just keep abreast. You may have an opportunity to come in and speak to a class full of students. And that can only, you know, look, look good on you as well as your employer, right? This, this person, this, this, this man or woman, this technician is really connected with the community. So never underestimate the value of community engagement, you know, as a technician, but absolutely, you know, keeping a rest of current manufacturer training. And again, we know it's there. Sometimes people are like, oh, I don't need to know that. I've been doing this for a long time. But, you know, keeping keeping abreast of anything that's updated and new and uh, keeping those relationships, you know, with your schools and again, fostering apprentices because that's the next generation. I appreciate yes. that. That's an absolutely yes. But those two things in there, I think, are, are the big ones. A, 
getting your training up to date as much as you yep. possibly can. We've had lots of conversations on the show about training, folks. You hear me preach it. I'm banging my head as much as I possibly can for you folks. You need to get your training. Level three technicians make more than double than level two technicians, yeah. which means functionally it's basic, intermediate, advanced. Level one, level two, level three. If you get your basic, if you get your intermediate, and you get your advanced level done. You get your advanced yeah. level done. And now this is the income data from the states, folks. Level three plus technicians make more than double what a level two does. Yeah, that's right. Wrap your head around that. That's one level. Yeah. One level. Just get it done. Now, those of you that will also be coming to me and coming to Patty saying, the more I learn, the less I earn. That means that you're probably not at a store with the right processes and right and the right leader. That's when you do need to talk to Patty or someone <laughs> like Patty to find yourself a better store when yeah. you get all that training and you're not earning more because they're not giving you any gravy to go along with all that warranty that you are able and capable of repairing. So I'd also like to jump in. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add as well. I've even um, probably shooting myself in the foot here, but. There, there's been times when I've gotten resumes from from technicians and and you know higher level apprentices, and they've just started somewhere like within the last six months. And I'm like, you know, I'm happy to book an appointment for you with the service manager, but why don't you bloom where you're planted? Bloom where you're planted, you know. Um, stay somewhere for at least a year, year and a half to two years. Again, rules have changed since COVID. We're not as fussy, but depending on the the, the way the apprentice um, or even technician has articulated, you know, you, we see a lot of times that a, a, a technician will write and then he, he or she wants to find another employer. It's like, you know, bloom where you're planted. I would rather talk to you in a year if you gave that employer that you were with through your whole apprenticeship at least a year with your 310S. And again, shooting myself in the foot, we still want you to come and work for us, but bloom where you're planted, either as an apprentice or in a technician, you know, you know, build your tenure out. Um, it's so hard to find tenures, you know, five or two, four, six years, um, you know, a, you know, po prior to COVID, we were looking for five to seven years experience. Post COVID, it's like, oh, if somebody's been there for two years, it's like they've been there for 10 years, you know, and again, through no fault of their own sometimes. So be prepared to ask those questions as well. If anybody survived a COVID chop or didn't survive a COVID chop, I, I, I hope that I speak on the behalf of recruiters that we understand that we understand that that March 13th, 2020, right through till, you know, March of 2022 was very offsetting for people. But we also learned an important lesson that we are an essential service service and sales, more so with service. People weren't, you know, in, initially weren't buying cars initially. They were having their cars serviced. They were like, I need to invest in this. So we became an essential service overnight. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the couple of things and go a little bit deeper on that is I really like that phrase, you know, blossom where you're planted or bloom where you're planted that, that I like that, but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. Not necessarily just, just growing, but I think there's a lot to learn from staying put. Now, there is a line in the sand between toxic of and not the right fit. There's a of line. Course. And yeah. you both have heard me talk about it before, but there's a line. And it takes time to really determine whether that line, where that line sits. Because each person's uh, reaction to circumstances is, is going to be different. Absolutely. Uh, the, subje the, the subjective stuff, you need to throw the subjective in the garbage and go look at the objective things. Yeah. Right? The fundamentals. Are you being paid? Forget about how much you're being paid. Are you being paid? That's right. Yes. Do they pay on time? Yes. Do they respect you and your opinion and your thoughts and your communication? Yes. Now, if at the end of the day, you're not making the money you want to make, Okay, there's also a series of things that you can do to improve your working environment so that you can make some more money based on your current circumstances. Again, right. that requires time, energy, investment, and self-accountability. You do those things, and that takes time. That's why Patty is saying uh, a blossom or bloom where you're planted. You take the time. You overview everything. You write things down. I preach. Get in your journal. Write stuff down. Write the things that concern you down. Write the things that are awesome down. That way you can go back and track it. 
That way you can look, okay, look at all the things that I've been doing to improve myself and improve my circumstances. After a year of doing that, these are the things that I've learned. These are the things that I've written down. And now I can go back to Patty after Patty said, hey, you know what? Why don't you spend some time there? Learn, grow, take it in. And then you can go back to Patty and say, hey, I've learned this, these 10 things. These are the things that I've grown. This is the education I've got there. I've done these five things to try and improve the circumstances. Unfortunately, the circumstances aren't improving. I would like not to deal with the circumstance anymore. I would like to find a better fit. Yeah. Then, then you're going to have so much ammunition to become so much better at the next facility. People like Patty are going to be like, oh, this... I've got written, I've got documentation, they're growing, they followed yeah, up yeah. with me. All of these things means like just more money, better fit, all of the great things. Yeah. And, and a lot of the soft from, skills. All of the soft skills. And it all comes from being a little bit patient. That's just right. a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. So that's awesome. So let's go into the recruiter bit a little bit. Let's uh, yeah. kind of delve into it. Let's go a little bit more. So the, the question that I think after, after the first uh, episode I recorded of the series, the most impactful one that I shared with the boys was, you know, what's the one thing that you would tell or teach a mechanic to say, this is what you need to know so that you can make sure you're working with a top tier recruiter. Oh, um, and again, I'm thinking of myself internally again, uh, say, ask me the question again. Sorry, Joshua. What's the one piece of advice you would give a mechanic to make sure that they can either ask questions or a tip to make sure they're working with a top tier recruiter? What questions? Um, they, they could certainly ask about the structure of the service department. That will impress a recruiter. Um, again, I, as far as a top tier recruiter, I can only think of, I only know, I've never worked externally as a recruiter. So I would want to, I would, I like being asked about company culture. Um, I like being asked, um, well, how many bays do you have? So very specifics about the shop. And I like hearing that they've done a little bit of research, but I'm just trying to turn that back around. How can they know that they're working with a top? And well, again, the, the soft skills goes towards us as well. If a recruiter is not getting back to you, if, a, if you text a recruiter, respond to a text and they didn't get back to you um, or follow up with an email that they said they were going to, then I would say, hey, this person Person, how is this person going to act? If this person is representing this company, how is that person going to act? Or how is the service manager going to act? That kind of thing, right? Is that really kind of what you were asking? Yeah. Sorry. I you may want to audio I'd clip like to go that, that a little bit deeper if we can. And, sure, and please. A little bit different for you. And this is why yeah. I think it's, it's, it's awesome to ask you. You as a recruiter, and you shared earlier on that you know how to uh, top up your washer fluid. Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah. the same token from a technical standpoint and kind of putting you a little on the spot, yeah. if you as a recruiter don't have knowledge, uh, specific technical knowledge, you are operating like, as you said, a little bit more like a gatekeeper to the service manager. Correct. So what would, I, I guess I'm trying to get really functional without trying to be too much here. How is a, how is a technician going to know that you are a top tier recruiter? Oh, if I you see. Don't okay. Have the if you don't have if you don't have the technical skills to be able to answer technical questions, yeah. how are they going to know that you are a good a good recruiter? Well, most of them are impressed that I even know what a three ten S license is, and I'll say okay. and I'll recognize and I'll recognize the program whether they've gone the traditional route. I'll say, did you go the traditional route? Because sometimes they won't put a college on their resume, and I have to dig a little bit. If I see somebody's gone to Mohawk or Centennial, I'm like, oh, I know that I know I'm involved in the program advisory committee there. So I think I sell myself a little bit in with regards to my own. Um, industry knowledge and you know we start chatting and i'll say and they're like oh yeah like if for instance if it's a subaru if somebody is applying for subaru and they're coming from nissan what what i'll often say so what do you like about subaru it's like oh my dad had this awesome subaru he let me take it apart i'm like oh my gosh that must have been so cool i recently talked to um, um a harley davidson apprentice who's grew up with his dad's bike in the kitchen and i'm like oh my gosh that must have been so cool so really getting, you know, letting them know that I know a little bit, but I'm not afraid to ask them to tell me a little bit more, you know, like um, mm -hmm. um, a young lady that I met um, a few years ago, her father, she ended up, uh, she's a licensed technician now, um, not Megan, somebody else. Um, 
she, her dad was into muscle cars. And I said, well, how, why do you, why do you want to be a technician? She goes, well, I grew up around muscle cars. You know what I mean? So there is a certain industry knowledge, but it's also lifestyle and cultural as well. Like the car culture, I don't have to tell you, you know, mm -hmm. we pay so much money for these things. Like I'm, I'm quite proud of my Jetta exec line. And I know it's kind of more of a geeky car for me. I love my, I love my Jetta, but uh, it's, it's, it's having that knowledge and being able to articulate and being humble enough to say, well, what do you mean by that? Like, well, you know, what does that mean? I've never, no, but no, to this day, nobody can tell me what um, MP4, MP, what is it? MP43, MP12C, the McLaren. There's a couple of different ones, right? But if you what, say what MP4, it? It, you're, oh, you're, you're, you're a slash and a four away from that's like one of the greatest cars of all time, which is right. Arizona's MP44. So you go back, that's like early nineties. But if you're talking yeah, about now, no, MP... MP, MP, I don't even know what the new one is. MP43. MP, I think MP, it was an MP43. MP43, <laughs> MP44, and then you've got uh, MP8C, I think is is right. one of the newer ones. I and Because that's not but, something that I commonly know. It's, all I hear all the time is like exactly. 670 and 720S and, and things like that. And go back nobody years. can tell me what those numbers are. And I'm like, well, I asked the technician, oh, I don't know what the numbers are. You know what I mean? I it's do. like, well, but being inquisitive. I love McLaren. I absolutely oh, love McLaren. Lovely They're brand. beautiful. They make a <laughs> wonderful noise. But I, I've never understand the models. I've never <laughs> understand how the models that don't at me. I just, I just remember, I remember over a decade ago working at the Chrysler store, and to my left was was Faf Motorsports, and it was like McLaren, McLaren, nine eleven, nine eleven, Cayman. McLaren <laughs> came in sitting it back. It's like just every day walking up, walking up to work and going, oh, they're so beautiful. Right. So and don't beautiful. Next door to, to, to that was, was uh, BMW. And next door to that was uh, Faf Porsche. That's where, right. When it was in the old building uh, around the corner. And it's just a line of 911s out front. And occasionally, uh, occasionally you'd hear uh, Chris Faf coming off the 407 onto West <laughs> and coming, coming into work. Because you could hear them from about three miles away because God knows there probably wasn't a cat on that 911. And of course, it was a custom color, right? It was uh, discount rent-a-car blue, I think, is what the color was. You can, ah, ah, you can hear them coming on the off-ramp, up and in, yeah. and, and across, and in. you can hear it. That's it's like, right. Uh, anyway, yeah. Sorry, we digressed to with McLaren, just... didn't we? <laughs> we yeah, got somehow we were talking McLaren. about McLaren. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Well, uh, I appreciate the time, the energy, and the effort to come out today, Patty. I really do. Oh, um, you're so throw down a little bit of a nostalgia and memory lane, as it were. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, do you have any anything, any shout outs you'd like to do? You, you've, you've any anything you'd like to to shout out? Any positions you'd like to shout out? Take well, the opportunity. Sure. Well, sure. I'd love to, you know, just again, formally unintroduce myself. I, I introduced myself in the beginning, but unintroduced in terms of us winding down. I am Patty Ruja. I am the Senior Talent Acquisition Partner for Auto Canada. Um, we have 29 dealerships in Ontario and I am on LinkedIn. Um, I'd be very happy to connect with any of your listeners if they reach out to me on LinkedIn. And as we were just talking about soft skills and building relationships, that's how you and I stay connected over for the last gosh 10 years my goodness but yeah i'd be mm. very happy to connect with anybody who's interested in finding more about more out about auto canada um i am new to the company so i haven't um I'm really did dove in yet in terms of what the recruiting requirements are but our website of course auto canada is pretty straightforward and i really appreciate your patience with me i'm a tech di dinosaur everyone and had a little bit of trouble getting on to Riverside podcast uh, platform, but Josh was very patient with me. So I really appreciated being invited and I'm happy to uh, do so again. Awesome. I appreciate that very much. And I'll make sure folks, I'll make sure the links um, I'll, I'm not going to put her email in the link down below, but I'll make sure that if you want to reach out to Patty, uh, you can contact me directly through LinkedIn or Instagram, or you can make a comment on the YouTube channel, whichever the, the case may be. Uh, reach out to me by email. You've got my leaders. You're my my email folks, leader at justworkhard.com. Reach out to me if you want to get in touch with Patty. Um, I'll make sure the links to Auto Canada and the recruitment page is in the post on LinkedIn as well. Uh, so you guys can find it there. And folks, I think that's the end of today's episode. I thank you very much for your patience and, and any technical that might get relayed out there in, into the world. So I appreciate that very much. 
I hope you enjoy this series. I think we got another maybe one or two after patties. I'm not entirely sure just yet, um, but we'll see. I hope you guys enjoy. I hope you subscribe. And uh, for folks, if you if you notice, I think this is the first episode that you're going to see here with the new merch uh, that my nice. mom said was company, and it is. So check it out. The link will be down below. And a quote to end the episode, as we always do. And this one's uh, relevant to the day. Reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body by Joseph Addison. Folks, remember, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.